Okay, so before we start, I think I should have made this announcement before I started the recording. I think it's just good to mention that I'm not an expert in whatever we are going to discuss. I have done my research and uh, I think a, a more of a discussion approach will help all of us for this discussion. So I'll be doing it in form of a presentation and the presentation is also on the week 11 folder. If you want to follow along, if my presentation disappears for one reason or another, you can just use, you can use that presentation from the week 11 folder. Okay, so straight to the presentation, what we'll be doing today is uh, automated creative um, optimization. The paper we'll be focusing on this specific topic has been done for for e-commerce for e-commerce products but uh, we can just use the same approach for um, for ads like we are doing creative ads this week so we'll be discussing it more on an e-commerce kind of approach but it's just the same concept that can be applied for for creative ads so let me just touch the um, the presentation if you have any question you can just ask at any time and as I will be staying on the call I, I see there are a lot of um maybe you can just admit admit the trainees as I shift to them to the presentation okay. Okay, so I hope everyone can see my screen. I didn't even tell my audio. I hope you guys can hear me because nobody has responded since I started talking. So I hope that you guys can actually hear me, hear me well. Can somebody just confirm that you can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, cool. Thanks. Okay, so as I mentioned, we are going through automated creative optimization, and this is uh, when we when we talk of automated creative optimization, we're just saying. With all the creatives that you guys have been exploring this this week, all the features that you guys have been that you guys extracted from the creatives, how do we know this? What combination of features which the creative will actually perform well? And the performing well in this case, we're just asking which creative will actually generate a higher CTR actually through a higher click for rate. So with this in mind, because we just want everyone to actually see this ad, they are able to just click it and interact with our ad, which is, I think, for Adlubio, this is where the benefit comes after that ad has actually been been clicked. So automated creative optimization will just focus on which ad do we show so that we can just increase the CTR. I hope that's clear. So just to give a background on why we actually need automated creative um, optimization is that whenever you have something that is appealing, maybe if it is just a visual, a visual experience, the, there are higher chances that you're actually going to get a higher click to it. When you look at the, the photos that I have to, to the left, most of them they just look appealing in terms of colors the way they've been organized there are different fonts you can see that are different fonts used here also different fonts used here you can see there are a number of uh of um of buttons used for each for each let's just call them creatives and when something is uh, visually visually appealing it tends to generate just we can say common knowledge it generates a higher click through rate when you look, I think for you guys, what you've interacted with ads, the ones that you've just passed by via the ones that even if you didn't end up buying, that you just clicked and uh, just interacted with, um, let's say, with the advertiser themselves. Like, for example, if you just saw an ad of Netflix, 
of uh, money haste you could just pass through it via maybe just clicking the yes let's go see this now and then maybe just going to see the review of that movie the ratings and just so many other things so we just want you to click that ad and then yeah i think that's, that's just what we're targeting so when we have when we look at these different ads and uh, the type of features and elements that you guys have um have explored we can actually in terms of colors in terms of fonts in terms of i don't know the background if, if there's a music if it's a video the kind of music that's being used the kind of buttons that are white buttons that are red button they are very different there are very many different features that form a creative and you can come up with very different combinations you could decide to use a green button with a purple i don't know just the many different kind of um combinations that you can come up with just to figure out okay so which creative will actually perform the best this comes up actually as a challenge because in a case where you only have something small uh you only have maybe you are thinking of just one ad and maybe you only have uh you're only considering two colors two buttons two fonts they're not the the choices are not as much as maybe when you are considering maybe you're considering i don't know 10 colors 10 buttons and the combinations of of the combination of the features that you can actually show show your users tend to increase i don't know they increase they just become many and this number of when they become a lot just doing maybe a, let's say let me do an a bit testing for every creative if you have 1000 i know some people end up having 100,000 kind of number of creatives if you said to me okay let me do an a bit testing for all this it could actually be so time so much time consuming so much um um time consuming and yeah a lot it would be really really very expensive at the same time you could you could notice that okay so maybe this ad you as we were, as they mentioned maybe for at Libya they do bidding and you could be showing the same ad multiple times in a day so maybe instead of doing just one ad you could do the same ad with the same information but tweaked depending on the number on the kind of um on the kind of features so that if an a user actually passed it the first time they could actually i don't know maybe the second time they see it it would actually entice them anyway so with this kind of knowledge in mind with this kind of knowledge in mind you notice that we have two major issues the reason as to why we'll actually introduce an automated kind of creative optimization so because of the complex interactions between the elements this is one of the major issues and then let's say for example you don't have so many elements you just have them um, a little i don't know so you decide okay let me go through each and every let me go through each and every combination show each and every combination and get the ctr for each and every combination so you might find when you just show everything you might end up overfitting your data because you just i don't know you're showing showing everything and this an issue is actually referred as a high variance when you're estimating this in ctr so I, I had somebody trying to join. I hope they were admitted. Oh my God. Okay. So with this kind of issues in mind, this is where automated creative optimization comes in. Instead of doing that A-B testing step by step, I want to do this, I don't know, take out of 100,000 creatives, test each and every one. Yeah. We want a method where um, instead of doing this manually you could just in a way maybe you have a hundred thousand so this, this is the basic idea behind automated creative optimization you just show all of them but you you show them in a random nature so for example out of your one hundred thousand maybe you just pick i don't know in one page you pick like different features so you're picking a white button this font this color this background you pick all of them you get one ad you show it to a user if that if that user gets to do a click through i don't know if that person clicks ad 
you update the information based on that combination. How did it perform? And then the next time you are rolling out another creative, you also get random features together, shared to the user. Depending on how it performs, again, you also give it a CTR value. How did it perform? So anytime you show something to a user and see the performance of how each, each ad performs, you update the information on your database. Eventually, you'll be able to know this combination does not work really well. This combination maybe tends to work really nicely. At, after some times, you'll tend to have, maybe you'll have like 10 to 50, which are performing really nicely. Of course, you continue. It's, it's an automatic process. It continues until finally maybe you have that one, that one creative that is really performing well. But since you'll be showing smart multiple times, the main thing in automated creative optimization is that basic, that idea of randomness. So we will just we will look at uh, um, um, the math, the math behind this thing. And when eventually you have this one, this one creative ad that keeps keeps on being shown, it could be that you did left, you did leave out something. And if one ad keeps being shown all the time, there's this idea of just okay, let me speak something as random, other features randomly, and again compare the values. So this is how automated. This is the basic idea behind automated creative optimization. We'll go into the nitty gritty of what happens behind the math, the math behind and. Um, yeah, up to that, I hope we've understood. I was doing some research and many companies are already using this at the moment. TikTok, TikTok is mainly using this for, for its uh, advertisement kind of campaigns. I think Meta, Meta, that's Facebook, Instagram, and um, is it WhatsApp? How they just show you the ads. They also use this kind of approach and auto call. And uh, I'm not sure of any other company, but those are the major ones that I have come across that they actually use this kind of approach. So I don't know up to date that's that's just clear. We'll go into the integrity. You'll notice the rest of the news the next rest of the of the, um, is mainly math. And I just wanted to know if that idea sinks that that is actually home. Is there a question is there a question something that is not clear of how how automated creative optimization works? now in the real world. Okay, so we'll just continue. Okay, so when we're mentioning the issues that arise with um, with showing creative ads, we had two main, two main issues. One is how will the elements which elements, which features do, will come up with the best interaction so that we get that highest click-through rates. Of course, most of the times, I don't know, we'll, that's one of the issues we had. The second issue was the high variance. Because you did overfit your data because of maybe of the sparse kind of data set that you had, you ended up going through everything and your data now, your click-through rate is very high. You have like a 100% click-through rate. And although that could look like, yeah, I did it, when you have that high variance, 100% click through rate, uh, overfitting is not really a good idea in, in machine learning. So anytime you see like maybe if I, I have a 100% click through rate, um, I don't know, something is wrong. You are going through an overfitting kind of issue, you have a high variance and you just need to, to reduce it. So to go through these two issues, for the first on um, interactions, when you just check, we say we have like a hundred thousand features, a hundred thousand elements. There are algorithms in machine learning, like the factorization machines, that actually they are made for this kind of problems. So I think I'll just be shifting on and off because of those who are joining. I'll be shifting. Okay. So a machine learning algorithm like factorization machines is actually built for this kind of this kind of issue a click like the way we have a recommender system the way we have um a classic okay okay a recommender system maybe a churn prediction system those kind of systems when we have this kind of click you are trying to have that ctr kind of problem factorization machines they actually they are meant for this it's a machine learning algorithm 
but what they do is just they actually look they normally look at just one operation between between two elements they look at some form of like um we look at oper different operators and they look at a multiply kind of operator between two two elements so they look they mean look at an an inner product and inner add that one element within uh, your creative and they just look at an operator function called multiply but this this while it actually works of course it not that does not work automated creative optimization tries to look at other operators since optimization machines just look at the multiply operators what happens when we look at an operator like um a minimum or maximum so what i'm trying to say is um let me just go ahead i think i'll be going up and forward and back so that it makes sense so when you look at this table down here when you look at factorization machines the kind of operators that they just use is a multiply kind of operator of course in the such space there are a number of operators that can be used between two elements between two features and factorization machines they only use the multiply kind of operator so the question with automated creative or automated i think i'll be saying out of course from now why it came up is they started asking questions what if we look at another operator like a plus operator what if we look at an operator like a max a maximum operator a operator a concat operator so there are there are five there are five different operators in this search space and the fm operation machines they only look at the multiple operator and they wanted to say okay so how do we go through all operators between our different elements is there do we think we will have a complex inter a complex interaction between our elements so with with that in mind having just having that kind of um, idea in mind instead of using a factorization machine which is a machine learning algorithm another such algorithm came up which is what is mainly used in autoco a one shot search algorithm what a one shot also will also go through this in general what a one shot search algorithm does is that between all our elements it tries to randomly select select an operator between our features between our elements i think i'll be interchanging the words but it just randomly selects an operator and see how these two how these two function let me just let me yeah let me do here so as you can see down here we have uh, different features we have maybe for example i'll call one i'll call one color another one font another one background same thing on the other side and what what one shot search algorithm does is it takes maybe for example this this element called maybe color on this creative and also takes another one create a color on another creative and just tries to model their interaction over something random so it could either be a multiple kind of operator a maximum just all the five operators that i mentioned so it does it randomly but if we do all of them at a go our words our um, if we do all of them at a go our algorithm will actually be very it will be too i don't know a lot of convergence will happen in our algorithm and so what what one shot tries to do is it introduces a constraint where in between between two between two elements only one operator can be chosen i hope that makes sense so it is a random choice for the operator but only one operator can be chosen between two between two elements and then it tries to model it tries to model like um a gradient descent of course it tries to to minimize to optimize that gradient descent until it finds okay i think the communication between these two elements is uh, mainly optimized when you use this kind of operator I hope that makes sense. Does that make sense? Maybe just I'll, I don't know. I think I've talked a lot about the one shot search algorithm. Does that make sense up there? Can I get an input? Because I've been talking a lot. Can I get an input?
is it making sense okay i'm only saying not really maybe just unmute okay maybe just to ask you Amanul, directly what what has made sense so far and what is it that has confused you something that i would go ahead and rephrase instead of just starting from the beginning Amanul, just go ahead and unmute and um Us. just the one shot search okay <clears throat> so as i was saying guys since we are having this click a city, we are trying to maximize that ctr if we are doing a machine learning kind of approach directly we could use an algorithm called a factorization machine but a factorization machine algorithm, while it works, it only models simple interactions using one operator, an operator, one operator in the search space, a multiply, a multiply operator. But there, are more, there is more than one operator in the search space. We have five. We have the multiply, we have the plus, the concat, the max, and the minimum. So. Is there a question? Yes, um, I, I wanted to say, uh, I want to ask about the operator. By the operator, you mean um, the feature? No, 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 no. I mean, just like in, let me see, when I say an operator, assume, assume like an arithmetic operator, like plus division. We usually have arithmetic operators plus division modulus such it's like how two features relate oh. it's not the feature itself it's how could we relate the two features okay Got that. Does that makes sense yeah so there are five of these operators in the search in the search space just like we have i think seven or ten in the arithmetic so we have five of them an FM, which is a direct machine learning algorithm, only uses one, a multiply operator. But Autoco came up with the question, what if we model the other operators? Instead of using a multiply, what if I use a max? Of course, you could just try and model everything, but this could take, again, could be very expensive, take so much time. But what one shot such algorithm does is it considers all the operators but it does so randomly between the features it could just say okay let me use a plus let me use a concat it is not defined it is just random how it's different how it um, models is the the interaction between these two elements between these two features is is very random but only one operator can be used by each interaction does that make sense, Amanu? Okay. With that in mind, of course, of course, we've done we've done one-shot algorithm. We've modeled the interaction between our elements. We've, we've chosen random operators. So we have these random, we have these random interactions that have been modeled. What comes hand in hand with um with one shot algorithm is what we call operation aware embedding. So what operation aware embedding does is now compares, it compares the results of the operations. Let me just go to that diagram again. And the diagram we have at, the diagram we have, uh, of course, some, okay, how should I say this? Let's call it, uh, it's a diagram. I hope you can see the diagram down here. So this is an, a combination. This is what operation aware embedding does. After we have the, sing, the singular one shots that have been done, this is a, you can follow this. This is a multiply, this is a max, this is a mean. What operation aware embedding does is it looks at all the operations that have been done between the features and compares which operation had the highest optimization. That's that's clear. I hope that's clear. 
I hope that's clear. So for one shot, for one shot search, we were doing interaction between features, random operators, and just getting a uh, value. But when we now do, of course, now we have these features, which has gone through five different operations individually. Operation aware embedding selects the interaction that had the, that was what that was optimized the highest. That makes sense. I just need a feedback before I continue. Yes, thank you, Ishak. That makes sense. So with just with just that, we solve the first issue, which is on modeling complex interactions between between elements between features so of course with with just that we can say okay so this this combination was selected this is what will be displaying to the user that's 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 what we're doing in the end um i yes, have a question it may uh, sound uh away from our topic but um if this uh uh algorithm used uh in the in the paper of attention, all you need um the NLB project because I, I saw that today you get that uh, the 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 one shot uh, mm -hmm. the can you refer to the to the uh, presentation? Yep. Yes. Um, so the drawing uh, explained the the, the one shot uh, algorithm work methodology, right? It's both. This has this has mixed both the one shot and the operational way embedding. This is mainly on the operational way embedding. Okay. So, thank you. Yeah. So I hope that's clear. I didn't, everything I've explained by the guys is just slide four, why we have this issue. And uh, yes, this, I've explained everything from four all the way to six. And with just one shot, such algorithm plus his names plus operation aware embedding, we get to only solve one issue the issue of model complex interactions between the elements another issue comes and let's say you had you just had sparse data you, and this way you're saying you have high variance your data overfitted Maybe yes you're showing the right creative you're showing the right connection with features but your data is just it has a high variance it's too overfitted how do we deal with this issue dealing with this issue we go ahead and apply a method called Thompson sampling. So Thompson sampling is mainly based on Bayesian, on the Bayesian models, on Bayesian, Bayesian inference, Bayesian networks. Let me just say Bayesian. <laughs> Thompson sampling is based on Bayesian. Where Bayesian, when I say Bayesian, it's, it's that case scenario where we, we consider a prior, something, some knowledge, that we have. Of course, we have some likelihood, some information that has been added, maybe some data, something we know, and then we come up with our posterior. So what Thompson sampling does, it mainly considers that posterior. What does it learn from the posterior? Then from what it learns from the posterior, it goes back and updates, updates our prior. Let me just see somebody else. Okay. Okay. So I hope I don't have so much on Thompson sampling. So I hope this will make this. Okay. So let's start with a scenario where we have we have just rolled out a campaign, an advertisement campaign, and we don't know which creatives have. We don't know which creatives have a high CTR. We don't know which creatives have a high CTR. 
we just have these creatives. We could have a million combinations, whatever combinations that we have. So since we do not have that information, we do not have that CTR, which is our likelihood, our posterior, the information that is um, is generated with our likelihood becomes exact exactly the same as our prior because we don't have any information. We don't have any CTR values of our creatives of our combinations. So because of what because of what we had at the what we just done one shot algorithm search, we did choose a couple of elements and so we just started showing we just started showing our ads, our creatives to the user. And when we show this creative, okay, so we have uh, we have we have a response. We see that this creative performed this way. So since we have now a posterior that we know, okay, this specific ad, this specific creative, maybe had a click through rate of let's say zero point eight, assuming out of one of zero point eight. So we go ahead and update this information on our data. So what we are trying in time when we are doing some form of um, Thompson sampling, of course, following a Bayesian kind of model, we are assuming that our prior follows a Gaussian kind of distribution. So when we, anytime we follow a Gaussian kind of distribution, two things come to mind. What's our mean and what is our standard deviation? So anytime we we have a posterior being updated, which goes back and updates, and updates our likelihood, it updates our mean, at the same time, it updates our standard deviation. So for us to achieve that highest, I don't know, that better best performing creative, we need our mean to be very, very small, both our mean and our standard deviation need to be very small, meaning that, I don't know, we narrow our, we just, we are this, we have this small percentage sure, but we will get a higher CTR. Not 100% CTR, of course, just a higher CTR. I don't know. Let me just go through this process. The process, the simple process that Thompson sampling actually follows. So we assume a prior. We don't know anything. So a prior is like we have these creatives. Then we sample the model weights from the posterior. We just show them to the user. We show them to the user, show them to the user, get a CTR from what they think. And then because of because of how maybe let's say creative XYZ performed, so we end up recommending that CTR a little bit more. Does that make sense? Since we have a CTR of let's say 0 0.8, we are saying okay, so this is good. We go ahead and say that yes, this creative is performing is performing better. Let's recommend this a little bit more. This this is performing it's performing it's performing less, it's not performing as good. So we just update its information and say this is not performing well. Let me just do this in layman stacks. So when we have this information, let's say we've run this for a week, for a month, and we have a couple of information. Now, instead of just having no likelihood, we've not shown this to our users. We now have some form of data that we've shown to our users and we've seen how they, how they are performing. With this data, we can now go ahead and randomly, again, I think I mentioned something about randomly, randomly select those creatives that have really nice CTR. So not just the highest, of course we don't do the highest. If you have about a hundred, we just don't show the one that is at the top. We show randomly the ones that did perform very well. Again, compare between the two, how will they perform? So Thompson sampling will keep on doing this, showing, comparing, updating, how did it perform? Again, showing, comparing, and updating, how did it perform? All the way until we have these two creatives of this one creative that performs really well and you'll find that maybe it will keep now showing this it will keep showing this creative every single time it has singled out every other it has singled out every other creative with different components different elements this is what thompson sampling sampling does so again this becomes an issue when only one creative keeps being shown every single time one creative give, keeps being shown and that's why when we do Thompson sampling in AutoCore, automated creative optimization, 
we have to introduce two other we have to introduce two other um, two other concepts the stochastic variation inference and uh, the reparameter reparameter hey, reparameterization trick <laughs> i've introduced another word i hope we are still together um, up to there so this is where my mind also gets boggled up together I know for sure what both of them try to achieve is that randomness. What, for example, the reparameterization trick, it just does, since we are, we stayed in Thompson, we are going at the posterior, so we are, we are back propagating like we do in, I think it's, it's in a loss, is it a loss function that does some backward propagation kind of, kind of approach. So we just look at how it's performing and then we try to update whatever we know going backwards so what the parameterization does whenever we do this kind of back propagation there could be some randomness within our data some noise but what the parameterization trick does it intentionally introduces a noise so that so that overfitting does not happen you know overfitting overfitting goes through every single noise every single out outlier in your data set and this is what we don't want let's just the variance is too high when we go through every single every single noise in our data set so when reparameterization does is introduces a random noise in your data it just introduces things that don't make sense so that it teaches your model not to go through that point <laughs> does that make sense i hope that makes sense so that you actually reduce you reduce the variance that your data comes up with at the end. On the other hand, I think I'll come to the questions in a few. On the other hand, what variational inference does <clears throat> is it tries to come up with these this gradients randomly at any point in your data. It just comes up with this gradient and tries to see how does data perform at this specific at this specific at this specific section so it's what i was it's what i was saying randomly like okay so let's take this combination let's take this combination of let's take this combination of elements so it says okay so these two elements are combined they are being shown how did they perform just randomly just pick and pick up anything and then this is how they are actually being shown to the user again going back and updating the data the data that we have any questions up there? I actually thank God that I did put on my video. I'm using a lot of hand movements. And I hope they're making sense. Does that make sense so far? Who, has, who is confused? Where are you confused? Do you have a question? any inputs i don't think i'll go on until we have some form of of input Okay, so you should be asking how back propagation works with one shot learning. Of course, I'm assuming you mean one shot search algorithm, different things. Um, <clears throat> that's a good question. I don't think I, I considered that in my research, how the two actually combine. All this time I was considering them working independently, but actually think that they could go together hand in hand because what we notice from one shot one shot search algorithm is that when you will get the most complex interaction between the two elements that one shot search algorithm could result in a high variance which is what we are trying to solve with the second approach Does that make sense, Tishak? Yeah. So 
we did start with issues, small interactions. One sh one sh one shot such algorithm helped to create more complex interactions. But then again, even though they give the most complex interactions, they could result in overfitting some form of high variance. Then we go ahead and introduce Thompson something, which of course uses some randomness, some reparameterization trick, and tries to reduce that variance just to remove that overfitting from our CTR. Okay, actually hope that you guys would speak, but um, we'd go ahead. So having gone through all that, that is how automated creative opera optimization works. Of course, I've added a couple of math, sorry. I have added a lot of math formulas and if you want to put this in action now, this is where you just go again and understand what, how do I do a one shot social algorithm? Of course, I don't know if I've not gone as far as researching if there's a way of doing this in like, um, like Python deep learning. I'm sure there's a way. What, what little research I did, I didn't get as much research on the one shot such algorithm and the, and the operator aware embedding, not, not much research on that. But on the Thompson sampling, there's something that you can just go ahead if you don't understand the algorithm, the math, the math behind it. But of course, if you want to come up with a calculation, how you can just model, model your work, now you can go ahead and actually go through this math. I've only showed a few, the main ones, for example, for the one-shot algorithm, what actually happens in the one-shot algorithm and what happens in the, what happens in the operation we are embedding same thing with what happens in the stochastic variational inference and reparameterization trick so those are the formula that i shared with you but if you want to go ahead you want to do more if you're more of the math person the math guy want to do this practically do the algorithm yourself the article that we are deriving this from the paper i've just opened it here it has a detailed discussion on what it has a detailed discussion. Like for example, if you just see, let me see the one shot. Mm, I think, I think, yeah, this is it. It has a detailed discussion on what, what does this symbol mean in one shot? What does this symbol mean? Of course, I think the case stands for the number of operations being used, where again, it can only be one. This is a constraint. So if you are interested in the math bit of it, just go through this paper. And I don't know, it took me some time to understand a few things, but yeah, if you're interested in the research and just the math behind it, this paper is very, very informative on how you can do this, of course, mathematically, statistically. Let's say statistically, statistically is much more, much more informed. So even everything I've just shortened, it is this entire 10 page paper. And um, yeah. We'll just go ahead and wrap up before I open the floor, the floor for questions. So of course, because we are, we are doing an analysis of a paper, what they did after introducing auto core, automated creative optimization is of course they went ahead and tested it on some synthetic results. Of course, just some dummy data came up with creatives, came up with elements, came up with everything and they just decided Let's put this to test. What's what the CTR? How does our how does our outcore algorithm perform in comparison to something like the the factorization machine? Maybe yeah, and other different other different algorithms, baseline algorithms. And as you can just see from the diagram, these are all the other algorithms. Something maybe which were used in the market previously, and the blue. <laughs> the blue line is how the auto core auto automated auto core how auto core performed which just shows that yeah this this method actually gives us a higher ctr same thing when you do a comparison this is done between auto core and baseline algorithms and this is done between auto core and the other interaction functions so maybe you're just doing a max alone a mean alone a concat alone a plus alone so when you're doing all of them singularly and when you're doing an auto core you just see again of course 
doesn't come out at the top as much, but still out of all performs gives us a higher CTR when we look at some synthetic data. Same thing, they do it with some real, some public data sets. Mushroom data set and an adult data set. I've not looked at these data sets. This is just information being displayed by, um, by the researchers. And when again you compare, when you compare with other baseline algorithms, and when you compare with just the interaction algorithms used singularly, you can see that we, what I said is that we are really trying to minimize, if you're looking at the, the mean and the standard deviation, we are trying to minimize to minimize these two, these two values. So you can see that our auto core has really low values, 3.02 mean, 0 0.51 standard deviation compared to others. You can see here a 5, a 6, 4.95. Same thing down here, you can see a 63, a 7, when our outcore is still at 3.02. Yeah, same thing as up here. So this is just evidence that auto automated, that outcore actually performs much better. Of course, same thing again was done, an online experiment, just rolling out creatives and collecting real-time data, some form of reinforcement learning, if you could say. And again, we still get the same kind of output where our auto call, even though it's for the first few days, they had the same kind of CTR going on. But after like the third day of running these experiments, you see that auto correlated, automated creative optimization tends to perform better in each and every kind of data set. Yeah, that's the end. So, any questions? Any questions? Yeah, just, just a second, guys. Any question? Any question up there? If you're interested in marketing, and let me just see who's on the call before it says very important. This this when whenever a, whenever um whenever a project is shared by a by a company that is that is already functioning, like Adlodio take much keen interest in such kind of projects because if you do come out at the top high chances are this company will will take you to work for them the reason as to why they share this kind of this kind of challenges with us in academy of course we go down to how it should be done within just one week but if you do have a nice understanding of what's going on if you can communicate Especially, you, you'll notice that optimization is not really in most of our tasks, but we've just given this tutorial because this is being used out there already. It's revolutionizing the advertisement industry. And yeah, the fact that Adeludio actually wanted this done by Ten Academy. Yeah, all this, you're doing it in group, these guys, they just understand what's going on. And who knows, in the next two weeks, you could have a job. That load you, yeah. Just saying, I don't know if there's any other question or if we could just end there. Um, the, the mathematical side is it easy to understand? Because I yeah. feel okay. I think it's easy. If you especially okay, sorry, is your question complete? Can we just continue with the question? No, no, it's it's already completed. If you have a statistical background, it is easy to understand. <laughs> yes, otherwise, mm. otherwise you'll be doing a lot of research. Of course, you could you could understand eventually, but you'd need to do a lot more research than somebody who has a statistical background. If you have a statistical background, you just look at an equation and you're like, 
Okay, this is doing some form of Bayesian modeling. And so you just know, okay, so this is a probability, this is that, this is that. If you have that kind of prior knowledge, understanding the the maths will be really simple. If you don't, just a couple of research and you will know what's going on. Of course, if you look, I don't know if... Okay. I personally didn't take statistics. I only took one course in Bayesian, was it Bayesian networks? <laughs> It has helped me on the prior posterior, like the whole understanding way easier. But yeah. Do we have somebody here who has um statistical background? You know the good thing about machine learning and tech industry is that somebody has done it, made it into a program, so you just import the library, whatever has already been done. And uh, yeah, you just use it for your work. But like I said, I've done a research on one, especially on one short search algorithm. I didn't get a lot, especially on YouTube. Oof, there's nothing on YouTube, <laughs> unless I did research very wrong. But there was nothing. There was nothing on one shot search algorithm on YouTube. So any question, can we, can we end it here? Do you have any question? Okay, I think instead of just holding you hostage in this call and there's no one responding, just go internalize. Actually, guys, this is actually being used in most of my research, I noticed, especially TikTok, TikTok comes up a lot. And if you're in TikTok, I don't know if you use TikTok a lot. Apparently, what they just do is you upload different videos. You are advertising the same product. Maybe you're advertising a jeans. So you, are, you upload up to, I think, 10 videos of the same product. You upload different texts so maybe some text that you'd like to build your products maybe in different fonts and maybe different kind of buttons in terms of colors so i think we have maybe provision for 10 videos to photos i think five texts forever and like three buttons or something so since tiktok is already doing this behind the scene what we are now trying to learn how to do out of course it's doing behind the scene as a tiktoker you just enable out of call of course at an at an increased expense and the algorithm does that for you it takes all your creatives tests every single creative until it finds that one creative that is performing really well with your audience yeah since no one wants to talk i think they can just end it there have a nice evening guys i think i'm waiting for five so that i use my entire hour but yeah have a nice evening guys